Hello, everyone. This is Kyle Welch with RCR Wireless News. I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, Capacity and Throughput Enhancements in LTU Networks, presented by Comscope. Our presenter today is Holger Radar, Product Line Manager, Base Station Antenna Systems at Comscope. At this time, I'd like to pass the presentation over to Holger. Thank you, Kyle. Welcome to this webinar. Thank you for joining me in this discussion about capacity and throughput in, in LTE networks. <clears throat> a few months ago, I went to uh, an outdoor event. It was a music festival here in Dallas. And I went to this event. It was not only a music uh, festival. It was, there was a lot of um, campers, uh, RVs around that uh, event area. And a lot of people camping there for several days. That's a preparation for the, for the concert. And I went over this area. And what I noticed when I took pictures and I wanted to upload some pictures or when I wanted to look at the web page, uh, look at a web page and get some information from there, often I didn't have any data coverage or it, when I could uh, download a web page or download some pictures, it was very slow. I think you've experienced the similar things at events or sport events or music concerts or in downtown areas. So what we see is, and a lot of subscribers see that, that their service is not consistent. And sometimes during the night, et cetera, or later times, it's much faster, better, better service. In some areas, it's, it's very bad because there's too many people. It's a, lot of, it's a peak of, of, of uh, subscribers demanding a lot of uh, capacity to uh, give a good service. So what I want to talk about today is how can we address these issues about capacity and the throughput speed? Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is Cooper's Law. So what is Cooper's Law and who is Martin Cooper? Martin Cooper is one of the most unknown inventors of one of the most important inventions. So he's considered as one of the inventors of the cell phone. And he's also a visionary for the wireless industry. So he, had a lot, a lot of thought, he put a lot of thought in uh, the wireless industry and where it's going. And what he noticed in his calculations that when he compared the demand it uh, doubles every 30 months. So if you have this logarithmic plot here, you see it's a line going up since uh, 1900, and it's expected to continue in this, in this growth. And it's independent of the technology, uh, and it keeps growing. And it's, it applies to all areas. So if you have a low level, you still grow in that, uh, in that uh, double every 30, 30 months. It, and even if you have a lot of traffic already, you still double every 33 months on this higher level. So that is very important for us to understand where this is going. And when we look at the data right now, we see we're actually surpassing that rate. So currently, uh, we are actually above that rate of 30 months, uh, uh, twice the traffic. In 2014, the traffic, the global mobile traffic grew 69%. And by 2019, it's projected to grow another 10 times. Uh, so we see also here, you can see on the left side, that it's global. It's not like one region which does, uh, which sees that growth. The growth is happening in all regions at a similar speed. Of course, there are like some peaks, and after a specific spectrum is being auctioned, some regions have a specific uh, acceleration of, of traffic coming after that rollout. Um, especially LTE is considered the, the key technology to address the, the, the challenge of capacity and throughput. Operators have a lot of pressure to provide more capacity and enhance the speed of the network. So not only do we need to provide more, more uh, capacity to provide more uh, uh, the data at the same time, we also want to have a better user experience so that the data can be transmitted faster as before. Uh, so, and all of these needs to be done with low running cost. So there's, there's pressure from shareholders, from company management to improve the quality of the network, but just do that in a very cost-efficient way. So how can we do that? So this is a big question, and one of the key drivers for additional traffic is going to be, or well, one, one key driver is the Internet of Things, the IoT, and uh, that is essentially the combination of all devices being connected with each other. So in the 1960s, there was some, some visions that, hey, we have one smart robot, which uh, the, which can do everything. We moved away from that, and the vision today is that we have a lot of smart, small devices all connected to each other. So you have your car connected, 
uh, you have your fridge connected to your smartphone so you have, can create a shopping list based on what's missing in your fridge. Uh, you can have your, you have intelligent and smart uh, uh, thermostats which manage your temperature in your house in a very efficient way. And all of these is going to be connected with your, with your phone or with your smart, uh, smart device. While a lot of this communication is going via Wi-Fi, so your fridge is probably going to be connected with your Wi-Fi server at your house, essentially what you want to control is from everywhere where you are. So there's a lot of com uh, connection which is going to be over an LTE network. And additionally, one of the key uh, discussion points that I have seen over the last months, which is becoming more and more important, is the, uh, the car as an LTE consumer. So when I drive, when I go on a road trip with my kids, my kids love to watch YouTube videos. So what they want to do when they sit in the back seat, they want to use their phone and want to go to some YouTube videos and watch uh, whatever they want to see. And what this is going to be a very, uh, a very big growth of the demand on networks. Currently, we have a lot of phones that you can uh, that you can utilize for that, but. Essentially, what's going to happen is a lot of cars are being sold now. They have an LTE um, a receiver into their, in, the, in the car that is being translated into a Wi-Fi server. So my kids can use their iPod or iPhone or iPad, use their Wi-Fi wi uh, connection to the car, and the car is getting the signals from the, from the LTE network. Cars are also very interesting because when we look at four times for MIMO, for example, you would need... Uh, uh, four uh, transmitting and four receiving antennas. Most receiving devices like phones are too small to have four receiving antennas. So therefore, we don't really see much four times four MIMO uh, being deployed right now. What we see is we see a lot of four times two, two receiving antennas. But a car is big enough. You can put even four 700 megahertz receiving antennas in a car. So cars can get a lot of high data rates. So there's a lot of talk about this. So there's a lot of Additional demand, which is growing, we see these growth rates of app downloads, etc. So, not only do we need to have more capacity, but we also need to be able to get that that uh, data faster. So, we see this data growth here, the, the speed growth, and currently it's like 10 megabit per second. It's expected in the 2023 to be in the hundreds of gigabits per second. So, key driver for that is. One of the key differentiators between phones like an iPhone or an Android device is that they have a lot of better resolution on their cameras. So the videos they take is a more and more high res. And when you upload these videos, it's significantly more data than if you uploaded a similar video several years ago because it's higher resolution. And we also have more phone cameras. So the pictures is the same thing. So the pictures sometimes are up to five megabits. Uh, uh, big and so it takes a lot of um, uh, it takes a long time to upload them. So therefore, in order to increase the, the user experience, we want to have the higher resolution pictures upload in the same speed or faster as we download a lower resolution picture in the past. And also, online gaming is is big. So for example, if you play, uh, if my, my son plays Clash of Clans, and when he's he, uh, when he's going on his phone, he's going there every like 30 minutes. These games are intended to that you return often to these games. So he's building his army, attacks the base, uh, and then in 30 minutes he comes back and does the same thing. So the games encourage you to come back and back. There's a lot of traffic. If I look at the data traffic on my, on my son's phone, these online games are the second most highest consumed data behind YouTube. YouTube is still number one, but the number two is some of these games because he constantly goes there to these games and um, and uh, uh, does small data packages, but the quantity, how often he does that, uh, generates a long, a big traffic over the entire month. Another aspect is cloud data access. So more and more data is stored in clouds. So we have pictures there, we have movies there, but the experience is only to, going to be sufficient if we can have access to the data quickly. If I go to a friend's house and want to show them a video of my son playing basketball or soccer, if it takes a long time that I can download that from the cloud and show it to him, then it's not a sufficient experience. We want to have faster throughput rate to get that, uh, get that good, good experience. And the same with social media, Facebook, Twitter, we want to get faster to, these, uh, to this data. So how can we add capacity? So if you look over the last decades, the 
there were three key uh, aspects how capacity has been increased. One was the, we increased this, we added some spectrum, and that has over the last decade added a factor three on it. If we, uh, we uh, increased the spectrum efficiency, there was a factor of six. But the big part and the big aspect of how capacity has been increased over the last decades is increasing the network density. That means we have more sectors with more radios on it, which gives us more capacity. That is still the number one factor. And if you need to increase the capacity by a factor of thousands, which we need to do over the last over the next uh, years, then the focus is still adding more sectors. And I will talk about later how this can be done in the most efficient way. So when we wanted to increase capacity and throughput, there's a, there are a lot of new technologies, new equipment, new hardware, new uh, standards that are being developed right now that are going to help us that are going to help us a lot with enhancing the capacity and the throughput speed. One thing is small cells. So small cells are going to help us with getting more capacity out. Um, there's the more spectrum management, which is going to be more efficient. Beamforming, which helps us to uh, direct the beam directly to the phone that we want to serve and away from the interfering. So that helps with the uh, performance on, in the network. CRAN is going to be, is, is going to be uh, implemented, and CRAN allows that more sites are being connected to the same baseband unit, which enables uh, time synchronization between these, all these sites, which, which in turn then uh, enables new technologies to be deployed or features to be deployed, which enhance the throughput speed, which could not be deployed if the synchronization between these sites weren't there. Uh, so you've, uh, you have uh, advanced interference cancellation techniques. For example, if you have a small cell, and the small cell uh, is overlaid on a on a macro layer, then there are techniques where you can block the resource spectrum, the resource blocks of the small cell from the macro cell. So the macro cell doesn't use the same blocks then to reduce the interference. So LTE Advanced brings a lot of feature there that, that uh, and these are just a few uh, that are coming in the next years. One thing is the, uh, related to often with 5G is massive MIMO. So massive MIMO is like when you have like a lot of uh, antennas. We're speaking about like five gigahertz, very small antennas, many arrays. So currently in most antennas you have like up to like two arrays, two columns of elements. Here we're speaking about like eight, 12, 16 columns of antennas which are very close to each other, high, they are very high in frequency, so they can be very small. And with more and more columns in parallel, you can achieve a much more data rate, a uh, much higher data rate. If you go to four times four MIMO, that's already difficult to achieve right now with 700 megahertz or AWS antenna, uh, because antenna would get very big. But if you go to higher frequencies, then you can have more and more uh, elements and I can achieve like 8 times 8, 16 times 16 MIMO in much higher data rates in a very short area. So here's a second law. So we have Cooper's law, and now we have Shannon's law. While Cooper's law was very important in telling us what's going to happen, Shannon's law is very important to understand what we can do about it. So Shannon's law describes that the available throughput rate depends on the signal to noise ratio in your network. So the ratio between the signal that comes from the serving uh, side to your phone in relation to all the interference and uh, noise that you feel and that you experience in the network determines how fast you can get data. Uh, that almost goes into a, in a, in an example as if you go into a restaurant and it's very loud, a lot of people are talking, if I want to communicate with my friends, I need to talk very slowly. If, if, uh, uh, when there's a lot of people are talking, there's a lot of background noise. But if nobody else is talking, I can talk very fast and people can understand me. So if you can reduce the noise, then we can continuously talk faster and get more data speed and get more throughput. So that is, a, that is an example of uh, why Shannon's law is so important. And it's, it's not linear. You actually see some jumps in performance. If you go over a specific threshold of signal-to-noise ratio, you can utilize higher modulation schemes. So QPSK is one, which is not very high data rate. 16 QAM is very common. If you can get to 64 QAM, then that is the best data rates right now that 
gives you really good throughput and uh, performance, downloading videos, uploading videos in a good way. Another aspect is PIM. PIM is, called, is passive intermodulation, and that it can be caused by loose metal-to-metal -metal connections in your RF path. It can be caused by when a RF cable is being cut and small pieces of ferromagnetic, material, uh, ferromagnetic uh, characteristic stays inside the cable and is not cleaned up correctly, or connectors are not tight connected, or a screw loosens over time. All these can cause PIM, and PIM is noise in the RF path. So essentially, if you have this, this guy here on the, on the slide talking to somebody, then his cell phone is trying to communicate to the antenna, which then tries to uh, send the signals to the radio. And if you have PIM in the RF path, that will, is similar to as if you have somebody playing music and the radio has a hard time understanding what the cell phone is trying to tell the radio. So therefore, the, re the receiver sensitivity is reduced and with that also the, uh, that, that reduces the data rate that can be achieved. There need to be resubmissions of data, et cetera, et cetera. So in general, uh, LTE requires superior noise suppression in the RF path because this guy otherwise cannot understand what the cell phone tries to tell him. So here's, a re <clears throat> here's some data about what a PIM can do to a site. This is a dental hospital and there's an antenna installed. Here you see two ports, port one, port two with the PIM results and also with the return loss. And what you see is, <clears throat> what you see is the data rate is relatively low. The interesting thing with PIM is you don't really see PIM. I mean, you can test for PIM when you have the antenna, but if you have a running network, you don't really see PIM. What you, an indicator for PIM in a network is that you have low data rate. The transported traffic is lower than expected, and that can indicate a PIM issue on a site. So we went to this one site here and looked at it, and there was a cable there which wasn't corrected, uh, connected correctly, it was loose, and then we fixed that. You see the PIM performance significantly improved, and also the return loss improved. And as a result, you see that the, uh, the throughput rate went up by a factor between 8 and 13. Significantly improvement. So this is what PIM does. If you have PIM, it slows your network down. If you remove the PIM, then you can go full speed. Now I want to talk about service areas in 2G, 3G, and 4G. When I was planning GSM networks in Germany in the 90s, um, our intention was cover as much area as possible in the, in the fastest time as, as, as you can. We got, uh, 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 in, in an auction, we got some licenses, and the conditions for these licenses was that we need to cover a specific percentage, 80% of the, of the country, and also 75% of the population. And we, uh, so in order to achieve that, we created, we used antennas which created a lot of coverage. In 2G, you can say that the service area is the area where you have a good signal strength. So you have an antenna that's brought out a signal and you can, the signal is strong enough to receive it, then this is your service area in 2G. So then in the end 90s and begin 2000s, we got a UMTS license and we started rolling out the UMTS network. Then it got a little bit more complicated. We noticed that the uh, simple equation that service area equals area with good signal strength doesn't uh, apply anymore. What we noticed that then when we have more and more traffic in the network, then the noise level on, of that network rises. And there, especially at the cell edge, we saw that, in the, that the signal to noise ratio was not good and good enough anymore to supply to support a good service. So therefore, the, the blue area here, which supply, which uh, says it's a good service area, is not equal the signal level by itself, which is a yellow area. So the service area is the area where you have a good signal to noise ratio. If your signal strength is good but you have too much noise, then it doesn't help you. So we need to reduce the noise level as much as possible. What happens is if you have a lot of cell phones, specifically at the cell edge, um, they create a lot of noise. The, the, the phone has a connection which is not very good. Then the phone bumps up its power through power management and to try to improve its individual link budget that can improve the, this specific connection. But if all phones do that, it raises the noise floor for everybody else. So that is not a, necessarily a good thing that happens. 
And additionally, if your phone runs on high power all the time, then the battery life goes down. So ideally, we, d we don't want the phones to run on high power, and we want the, the cover the, the, the border a little bit better. So this is a complexity that we saw in, see in 2G and 3G, uh, 3G and 4G. When we look at throughput rates, so here you can see some of the recent technologies, uh, HSPA and then LTE, we see that the throughput rate goes up and up with more and more uh, advanced technologies that we, that we have. One thing that is, and we also see that in the core, the throughput rate is the best. That means because the signal strength is bigger there, so the signal to noise ratio is better, so you see that the throughput rate is always best closer to the side. In LTE, there's an additional aspect to it, which is that if you have a continuous frequency block of like, or like frequency band of 10 megahertz or 20 megahertz, that has an impact on what the throughput rate is. If you have 20 megahertz continuous frequency band that you can utilize, you have a better throughput rate than if, than if you had only 10 megahertz. That is great. Unfortunately, not every operator has the luxury of having 20 megahertz uh, frequency bands continuous uh, to utilize in each of their markets. So therefore, uh, LTE, the, uh, LTE Advanced show, have set some new features, and one feature is carrier aggregation. With this carrier aggregation feature, it allows to combine two frequency blocks, which don't need to be continuous. So you can take 10 megahertz from a 700 megahertz band and 10 megahertz from an 850 megahertz band and combine these, carrier aggregate them. And that means that you can actually add these two throughput rates together. So here, if you see that your primary LTE carrier has a rate, an average data rate of 33.4 megabit per second, and then the secondary LTE carrier has 30.7 megabit per second. If you carry aggregate them together with LTE Advanced, you get to around the addition to that. You have some con combining losses there, but it's really only marginal. It's like only a few megabit per second. Essentially, if you see them on the bottom, it significantly lifts your minimum throughput rate. So while you see if you have these uh, single carriers, you had a lot of people which had less even than 10 megabit per second throughput rate with the carrier aggregation frequency, uh, you had this number was significantly reduced, and you have actually eight or six percent of, of uh, users had 10, 110 megabits per second or more. So we see here the big benefit by transporting the traffic faster. You also free the resource blocks faster. So there's a lot of uh, benefit of carrier aggregation. There's a lot of scenarios for carrier aggregation. One is uh, the scenario one which has two, uh, two frequencies on top of each other which are very close in its frequency. So, for example, you have 700 and 850 megahertz. The, the distance of the, the, uh, of the sector depends on the frequency itself. If you, for, if you have, for example, um, 850 megahertz coverage compared to 1900, you can always say there's almost a factor two in coverage size between these. If you have 700 and 850, they're close enough so that they almost overlap. That's what you want to do. Then you have an entire network which is carrier aggregated and not only like some hot spots close to the side. Scenario two is an alternative. If you don't have the option of using two frequencies which are close to each other, then you can, for example, use 700 megahertz, which is the dark blue, and the light blue is AWS, which is less in, in coverage, but still you cover the area around the side but you will switch between forth and back between the, the modes, which is kind of a loss uh, because it, every time you switch back and forth between the modes, you, you lose some of uh, the, the traffic in these uh, reorganization of the modes. So now your three is in a mode that has been suggested to improve the minimum throughput rate by putting the secondary carrier into the nulls of the primary carrier. That has a, it's probably not going to happen much simply from the fact that that antennas that are being deployed right now are like six port, eight port antennas with more and more bands in one antenna, and they don't have the option to have different beam directions of two different bands. So therefore, scenario three, I think, is not going to happen. Scenario four is if you have like some small cells on top of your macro cells. So you have a macro cell layer, and then you have small cells, and you carry like a gate where you have your hotspots. That's going to happen, and this is a very useful application. So in general, carrier aggregation can uh, help to uh, transmit data much faster. Not, in some applications, carrier aggregation is not useful. 
if you, for example, cover a stadium or an area where you have a lot of users, then transmitting data very fast to a few people is not necessarily the goal you want to achieve. Uh, if you have an, an, an event area, an, an event where you have tens of thousands of people, then it's probably better to have two channels which transmit data to more people instead of having half of the people getting a lot of data fast. So that's the better experience for the entire uh, number of people. So now uh, this slide shows how the performance degrades with range. So the, assuming that in the noise in the network is, is constant everywhere, then we see the signal level go down the further you are away from the site. So that means the signal to noise ratio with the constant noise and the uh, uh, signal level that goes further down, the signal to noise ratio, it gets worse and worse the further you're away from the site. That means if you look at the lower left corner here on, in that slide, that 64 qram it can be used close to the area, close to the site where you have a lot of good signal strength overcoming most of the noise, which is equivalent to the green area there on the right side. Then in an area further away, the signal to noise ratio drops a little and it doesn't allow 64 qram anymore. So we switch to 16 qram, which then somehow relates to the yellow area on the right side. It's still a good data rate. Uh, it's a transition area. Everywhere where you had cannot use 64 qram, you go into QPSK. And the QPSK coverage is, yeah, you have basic coverage, but it's not really good. So as a key, as, as a radio planner, I'm thinking, what can I do to improve my, my network performance to push the 64 qram areas out? I want to co cover as, give the user experience to as many subscribers as possible to have high data rates. Watching a YouTube video in HD instead of a low resolution and the same speed as before. So this is essentially what you see here. In the green area, you can watch an HD video in the same speed as you can do just a low resolution video in the blue area. And we want to make sure, we want, our target is that our, all the subscribers have a good experience with high data rates. Overlap matters. So when we look at these um, uh, patterns here, so you see three patterns for three sector sites. When I plan GSM networks, we try to get as much coverage out as possible. And what we did is we used all 90 degree antennas and 65 degree antennas. If you use a 65, 60 degree antenna, you see that the nulls between the sectors is very small. This is the, the white area in the, in the pattern chart between the green and the blue sector, for example. And it's around 6 dB uh, suppression there between the sectors, which is pretty low, which is good for coverage. But you see the overlapping areas, which is the dark areas between the blue and the green and the blue and the red and the red and the green. These three dark areas are very big. So you have a lot of cell overlap. This didn't matter much in GSM because you, you can have up to like 9 and 21 different signals from 9 to 21 different antennas at the same location and still could provide a good service to the, 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 the subscriber there. And that is because GSM had fantastic frequency interference, uh, interference management tools like frequency hopping or other, tool, other uh, features. So there are a lot of different things that could be done to manage all these frequencies. Um, so, but then we went to 65 degree antennas and 65 degree antennas, when you, when you put them into a site, you see that the now between the sectors is normally around like 10 dB. So there's a wide area between the sectors there. Um, that is a little bit sacrificed in coverage, but it's still coverage. It's still very good. And you reduce the cell overlap significantly and not each not antenna is different. They're actually high performance 65 degree antennas, which still have the same coverage still 10 dB down between the sectors, but you see that the cell overlap, the dark areas, is significantly reduced to a not high performance antenna. So the beam width itself does not necessarily indicate a good roll-off. Roll-off is the word here that we are looking for. The roll-off is how fast a beam, uh, how fast the pattern um, goes, uh, cuts off at the cell edge, because you want to cover as much possible into a 120 degree sector but then afterwards, at the plus 60 degree, we want to uh, uh, suppress as much signal as possible. So the roll-off is more important than the actual beam width. So what we see now in LTE, we actually see several, uh, lots of application now for 45 degree antennas, which have even more uh, 
a, a, a better uh, reduction of cell overlap. Here you see that there is some sacrifice in, in coverage in between. So you have around 20 dB, uh, 17 to 20 dB between the sectors, which is a slight sacrifice of coverage. But therefore, you gain a lot of improvement in signal-to-noise ratio because the cell overlap is significantly reduced. So we did some analysis and looked like, hey, is the sacrifice in coverage too big for the gain you get in signal-to-noise ratio? Or is the signal-to-noise ratio benefit so big that it's worth sacrificing the coverage? So the result was that in urban areas where you have a high cell density, where the sites are very close to each other, and also where you have a lot of buildings which cause reflections, 45 degrees antennas work pretty well. So essentially what you have is with if the green uh, beam in this uh, slide here broadcast, it might hit a building which then hits it in 45 degree and then the beam reflects back into what's the white area in between. So you get some signals from reflections that actually, so the nulls here between the sectors are actually not as visible in the real world as it appears in a radio planning tool. Because ray plane tools, uh, unless you use a ray tracing module, it doesn't consider uh, reflections. So in urban areas, 45 degree antennas work actually pretty well. In rural areas, I wouldn't use 45 degree antennas because there you don't have the reflections and the sites are very far away from each other. Uh, there I would not uh, utilize 45 degree antennas because uh, I would use 65 degree antennas in rural areas. So in order to reduce the cell overlap, one thing is to, is to utilize a narrower beam antenna or a better roll-off antenna. Another aspect is to reduce the cell overlap to uh, another antenna which is in the same beam direction. In order to do that, you can tilt these beams down. And there you, have, you, can, you still have a little cell overlap, but not too much. And uh, the key aspect of preventing cell overlap is to minimize the impact, uh, minimize mechanical tilting. I have some slides here which show us what happens if you use too much mechanical tilting. So here is here I describe the options that you have when you tilt antennas. So the first one is you use mechanical tilting, which means actually you physically move the antenna, which means the beam still broadcasts in 90 degree uh, direction from the antenna face. Uh, in the front, that is okay. But in the left and on the right, it doesn't tilt at all. And in the back, the beam actually goes up. So if you look on the upper right, you see that the, uh, that the side loads actually are pro, uh, stronger than the main beam direction, which is what we call pattern blooming. It's, it's, a, it's an interference in the network. An alternative way to mechanical tilting is electrical tilting. Electrical tilting works this way. When you, brought, when you send the signals to each element in an antenna, we might, let's say there are 10 elements in an antenna. And if you send the, uh, the, the broadcasted signal to all of these elements at the same time, then the beam is going horizontal. If you create a little phase delay between these signals, so the top signal, the, the, every element uh, gets the signal a little bit later than the bottom one, then you slowly tilt down the beam. And there's a phase shifter inside an antenna, and if, uh, the, if you move that phase shifter, then further and further down, it moves the linkage system, which then uh, 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 is connected to a motor. So a motor can move the linkage system to move the phase shifter, and the phase shifter then beams that tilt. And the, the, the beautiful thing of the electrical tilting is that it tilts the beam 360 degrees all around the antenna. That means the back lobe is going down, and you also have the side lobes suppressed. So what you see on the lower right, regardless how deep you tilt the beam, the, the, the pattern shape is maintained. And there's significantly better performance. So therefore, I recommend not using mechanical tilting if you can prevent it. Um, another aspect is red is good. We talked about using uh, minimizing the cell overlap. Red is just the beginning. So remote electrical tilt by moving like one side, yeah, this one should, down, should be two degrees further down to remove the cell overlap, uh, to reduce the cell overlap. SON is the next step. So SON is a self-optimizing network or self-organizing network, which is based on measurements on the network, which is being compared to key performance indicators in, the net, in, in, in your system. And if some of these key performance indicators, like throughput or specific quality levels, are being violated, 
then some algorithm is being kicked off to calculate what needs to be done to fix that. And then specific steps can automatically be implemented. And that can be like changing the power, it can be changing the tilt, it can be several other as aspects. And there are several different levels of automation. Some give recommendation to a planner and then they implement it. There can really be an automated system which automatically implements these. There are several different ways. So SON is coming and it helps to, uh, to uh, react to dynamic traffic patterns. Here's an example of uh, what happens with mechanical tilting and also describing a key factor which is called the suppression on the horizon. Suppression on the horizon means, if you look on the right side, this is the vertical pattern of an antenna. And you have two different antennas here, a blue antenna and a red antenna. So if you tilt these antenna to the maximum electrical tilt level, the red antenna had a 10 degree maximum electrical tilt and the blue antenna had a maximum tilt level of 16 degrees. If you then look at the zero degree line, this is the horizon, how much is the beam suppressed? Because that is the key factor of how much this antenna is being broadcasting into other neighboring sectors, which is all interference. The better the suppression, the better. And if you see the red antenna has only 3 dB suppression on the horizon, the blue antenna has 15 dB suppression on the horizon. So, so 15 is a very good value for suppression on the horizon. And what you can also see on the left side now is when you look at the horizontal pattern, it's not only in the front where you see the difference between the, the 3 and the, uh, and the 15 dB, you see also on the side, the side and back lobes are also not suppressed well if you cannot tilt much. So in general, the, the electrical tilt level, the maximum electrical tilt level is important, but it's just an indicator about how well it can suppress the beam. And ideally, the, the tilt range should, be, should allow that the beam is so far tilted that the null is at the zero degree line. You see the null is going here currently with the blue one. It's, it's like very close to the zero degree line now. So if you can get that, uh, if, if you can tilt the antenna so far down, that is excellent. So, but you have these red antenna here now. So what could you do to fix it? So the people who had these red antenna now tried to tilt down these antenna more by adding mechanical tilting to electrical tilting. So if you look at the right side, you see they added some mechanical tilting to the electrical tilt, which looks good on the vertical pattern there. You see like, hey, no, it almost looks identical. That's great. If you look on the left side, you look the, at the uh, horizontal pattern, then you see that yes, while in the zero degree line, in the main beam direction, it is suppressed in a similar way now, but you see that there's a lot of side and back lobes which uh, interfere with other sectors. Essentially, you want to have the coverage as strong as possible in the 120 degree sectors, which is plus minus 60 degrees. Everything that's below the minus 60 and below the 60 is interference. And you see this big area which is co covered by the red antenna, it's all interference. So therefore, mechanical tilting adding to electrical tilting does not necessarily fix the issue. So looking at antennas which can tilt far down is a, is a very good uh, feature. So now I want to talk about what can we actually do to add capacity to the network. So I talked about before a key factor to add capacity is adding more sectors. And what, I, what I'm describing here is small cells is a key factor to do that. It's more getting more and more difficult to deploy mac new macro cells, and it's, getting all, it's also very expensive, and it takes a long time to get approval and get a site build. It takes a lot of time, and get the return of investment back is, is a long time frame. So therefore, small cells are being more, getting more and more popular. When you ask, what is a small cell? You get from 10 people, you probably get 10 different answers. Uh, and initially, it was like just a, a little small box radio with, uh, with an antenna included, and then it gets now bigger and bigger because when you look at the return of investment calculations, it seems that uh, like a two-foot antenna gives a good return of investment because the smaller the antenna, the less coverage you, you, you have and the more antennas you need to deploy. If you look at the deploy cost for each site, at some point you get, you get a fracture point there where you have, if you deploy too many sites, it costs too much. Therefore, a two-foot size gives and uh, antenna size gives a good coverage area, but it doesn't require to deploy too many sites. So the, the, our calculations show that two foot antennas give, are close to giving the best return of investment. Also the power changed. Initially it was like one to five watts. Now we're seeing five to 20 watts. 
and I, ha I know there are operators which deploy actually 60 watts on some small cells. They actually use this as mini macro sites. They use actually a normal macro site infrastructure on a small antenna. And uh, there's, there's, some, there's a definition of a small cell which simplifies some FCC approvals, which means that if the antenna has less than three cubic feet in volume, then you have a simplified approval, uh, approval process. So that is what we see. So antennas can actually be up to like three and a half foot long and still be less than three cubic feet. In some areas, that simplifies approval. One key factor of small cells is there's a lot of different shapes and forms. Uh, in a traditional antennas, microcell antennas, normally you have like a panel antenna which covers one, one direction. In small cells, you often only deploy one antenna, but you want to cover multiple directions. So you have, for example, a trisector antenna. So you have a canister with three panels in it pointing at three different directions, and then you cover three different directions with three different radios. What's even more popular, because sometimes there's not enough space on it, and at the moment there's not enough traffic yet, that uh, just one radio is being deployed. What you use then is you use like a, a new antenna form which is called quasi-omni. So it's like an omni antenna but it's not really an omni. So what you have is you take a three sector or three panel canister antenna, so that's like an, let's say an eight, eight inch wide high band canister antenna which has three panels broadcasting in three different directions but instead of connecting three different radios to these three panels you combine them internally you have only two connectors on this antenna, and then these two connectors are attached to one radio. That radio essentially then broadcasts the same signals into all three directions. And as a resulting pattern, you get like a pattern which is almost omni-like, but you have peaks and nulls in, uh, in, in so uh, and, and then three nulls in between the peaks. That is important because it has a significant impact on the ability to mitigate external PEM. There's a white paper from uh, Tom Bell from Enritsu, and he has uh, uh, shown there how uh, quasi-omni can mitigate external PIM sources. You have, uh, if you turn an antenna and direct the null into the direction of an external PIM source, then you can reduce the PIM by up to 30 dB. So essentially, when you want to install a small cell, there is a lot of metal around there. So you have a lot of poles, uh, like uh, light poles or other metal structures in downtown areas which can be PIM sources. Sometimes we don't know which the, what the PIM source is. And in order to figure that out, you can put your uh, quasi omni, put the PIM tester on it, turn it 360 degrees and see where the best PIM performance is and then install it that way. Uh, in, in some cases it's clear it's the pole where it's attached to, but in some cases it's not clear. So that's a good way to uh, use these quasi-omni. But there are a lot of other shapes. There are back-to-back -back antennas and the heart-shaped small cells. There's a lot of different options to perfectly plan these little sectors in your uh, urban areas to give the coverage, coverage to the areas where it needs to be, but keep it out where it shouldn't be. Also, red is very important as well for, or like tilting is important for small cells as well. Uh, they're, they're installed in areas where sometimes you want to tilt them further down to not broadcast the signal too far. And so we see some throughput data here. The throughput really is good on, a, on these quasi-omni antennas and you see a lot of improvement uh, compared to normal antennas. Another way to add some more capacity is, is using multi-beam antennas. So instead of adding like uh, small cells over, overlapping uh, uh, on, a, on a macro cell, we, we modify the macro cell layer by making the beams narrower. So instead of uh, covering 120 degrees with a 65 degree antenna, you can create, for example, two beams which cover each uh, uh, 60 degrees. So um, essentially, if you can take one antenna down, replace it with a second antenna, so you keep the antenna count the same to simplify least impact. Um, but then you have the, by, by having two beams, that allows you to add a second radio to the side. That's huge. So you can add essentially almost double the capacity. It's not exactly double, it's like 1.8 times in, in added capacity. So what we see here is you have an example with a water tower. So there's a neighborhood that was built, and they built a water tower to supply water to this neighborhood so they can take showers and wash. So, but the neighborhood was growing and growing and growing, and there's more water needed. Uh, so what they, they added, uh, they, they, so they, they increased the size of the tank on the water tower 
and the tank size is now 1.8 times, which is almost well, what you get in capacity gain with the twin beam antenna. And also, in addition to that, when you have a twin beam antenna, you don't only get more capacity, you have uh, uh, three other key benefits. One is the narrower the beam, the higher the gain. So if you have more gain, that improves the signal in the signal to noise ratio we discussed about. Also, if you have a narrow beam, you have a better suppression on the side and on the back. That means you have a better interference uh, uh, mitigation. So the noise is reduced. So if the signal strength goes up, the noise goes down, then you have a significantly improved signal to noise ratio, which means you not only have more capacity, but you also improve the throughput rate uh, because you can transmit the data faster. If you look at the total transmitted throughput improvements of this uh, type of antennas, you actually see that the throughput, total throughput can be increased by about like 2.7 uh, because you transmit the data in a higher transmission mode. By having a better signal to noise ratio, you can switch to 64 quam in more areas of that sector, which allows you to transmit significantly more data than you uh, did before. So essentially, if you have that, you can go, instead from a three sector side, you can go to a six sector side, uh, doubling your capacity. So there's a lot of applications, so you can actually, the, be the beauty of, that, uh, of this application is you can improve your return of investment of already built sites. You can just utilize the sites you have, take the standard antenna down, put a twin beam antenna up, and, or a five beam or tri beam, and you, have, you can increase your return of investment of that site. Also, by having more gain, you have better signal uh, building penetration, better in-building coverage. So for downtown areas, these are perfect antennas to get better signal strength and more capacity. Here you see the impact of the throughput rate uh, based on the number of connected users. So if you look at the same number of connected users, if you go from a three to a six sector site, then you, the throughput rate increases uh, significantly. So you have a much better RF path, cleaner path, it's a, it's a, it's a better throughput rate, it's a better network. So the next step, if twin beam is not enough, so there's a tri-beam which goes even further. And here on the left side, you see the pattern where you have three beams coming out of one antenna. And as a comparison, you have the pink pattern there, which is a standard 65 degree antenna. So the, as, we said, as, as I said before, you want to cover 120 degrees with one antenna. This goes, in this case here, for, uh, for plus 60 and minus 60 degrees. If you look at the green and the blue pattern, they just slightly overlap with the plus and, six, plus and minus 60 degrees. Perfect, perfect antenna for this application to maximize the power and energy that goes inside the sector, but minimizes the energy that goes into the neighboring sectors. If you see the 65 degree antenna there, it has a much more impact on the neighboring sectors because more energy is being broadcasted into, these, uh, into the neighboring sectors. One aspect is if you deploy twin beam or uh, tri beam antennas, they have more gain. So I expect that if you exchange a 65 degree antenna with a twin beam or tri beam, you would apply a higher tilt level to these antennas to maintain the same cell radius. Uh, if you would just use the same tilt on these antennas, you would broadcast further away than the 65 degree antenna did because the antenna has more gain. So you, what, you're going, what you're going to do is you tilt the antenna further down than the 65 degree antenna get a better signal strength inside the sector, uh, but it's, it's, it's important that these antennas are being optimized. They cannot do just a, a one and plug and play replacement of a 65. If they're optimized, they, they, they promise great results. Uh, and theoretically, you can go to a nine sector site in very downtown Chicago, downtown areas. It's downtown areas where you have a lot of areas, a lot of capacity needs, uh, based a lot of people constantly creating traffic. Uh, this is an option there. And then one of the nice things is that you have that these beams, the, the geom geometric form of the uh, tri-beam very nicely fits into the nulls of the neighboring uh, nine-sector antenna, a nine-sector side. So we see here nine-sector sides, and the beams nicely fit into the nulls of each other, really giving a nice small overlap, but uh, n uh, negating the coverage nulls of the three beams because the, 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 the beam of the neighboring side goes into this now. It's very nicely, it's very nicely together. So I don't think every side will get a tri-beam, twin beam, five beam, or what, whatever beam. It's another tool in the toolbox. As RF planners, we know we need to deploy solutions which perfectly fit each side. 
And here the, on the upper left, the scenario here, I had a five beam covering an outdoor event area, high capacity needs. The, and there was a twin beam antenna deployed, which covered the parking lot for the people going, uh, going there. So it was more, not as much as the event, but there's still a lot of capacity needed. And then there's a normal 65 degree antenna going down, which uh, covered the uh, a rural area with a farm over there. So a lot of applications and different tilt levels, twin beams can be tilted to several levels. There's a lot of applications. There is another tool in the toolbox which enables us to, to design, design a great network. Here's an application for uh, outdoor events or uh, open stadiums where you have, for example, like a five beam antenna which covers a lot of uh, people during the event. You have like there's a two times nine beam antenna which covers uh, two rows of, uh, the, the, uh, there's like two rows rows of nine beams, the, to the upper row of nine beams covers the top seating and the lower beams cover the bottom seating and you can have just one antenna cover the entire, entire stadium. The nice thing of that is all the beams are already optimized for minimum cell overlap so you don't need to reorient the antenna and figure out which direction they need to be. You just figure, put the antenna up and all the beams are already optimized to each other. Uh, it's very nice, uh, very nice antennas. So here's an application, and on the lower left side, I, I ask you if you can find the antennas that are down there. So I'll see if you can find some antennas that are deployed there while I continue talking. I will come back to that in a minute. So these antennas are very nice for, for uh, um, carry-on wheels and carry-on light trucks, open stadiums and arenas. They're very nice applications. And uh, of course, you see a difference if it's low band or high band. So you see the implication up there on the lower right. We see like the small antenna and the two big ones. So uh, a low band antenna is much bigger than a small, a small uh, than a high band antenna, but both of them are needed in some applications. So on the lower right, you see all the radios connected to these few antennas. So it can be very organized and can look very nice. So I hope you found the antenna. So one of the antenna, one of these antennas is on the lower right of the McDonald's sign, and there are two antennas under the UPMC Life Changing Medicine area there, so the two antennas there. So you, it's almost like um, if you look at it, you can't really see that they're antennas. I mean, maybe at some time they're putting a commercial on it, I put some coloring on it that would be even more covering up. But these antennas are very well suited for events. Uh, we have, for example, one of these 18 beam antennas is covering NASCAR tracks. One antenna covers the entire area. So when we talk about the RF path performance, we want high performance, we want high data rate, we want uh, high capacity. This, the network performance is like a chain. It needs to have strong elements. If one element breaks, the chain breaks. So it's not enough to have a good antenna. It's not enough to have a good radio. It's not enough to have good cables. You need to have all of it. If you have a good antenna, great radio, but uh, the cable is not good, or the cable is not installed well, or you have a great red antenna but it's not optimized, then the performance is not good. It's, it's a chain. You need to have uh, good components, you need to have good radio, you need to have good uh, uh, cabling, you need to have good diplexers, TMAs, you need to have good, whatever is needed on this side. All the components need to be working well and supporting the good high performance. If one of them breaks, the performance breaks. If you have PIM in the network, then the best antenna or best radio doesn't help you. It will, it will uh, degrade the performance. Here's an example. So if you have these Bose Entertainment System and put a $20 cheaper, uh, $20 cheap uh, speaker on it, yes, it will play music, but it will not get the rich sound that you get if you put the the uh, the uh, speakers on it, which uh, accelerate and 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 transport the rich sound of this entertainment system. So we need to have a good performance of all elements to get a good RF pass performance. So now I'm summarizing uh, what we can, what we talked about here today. Uh, so the key factor to improve uh, capacity and throughput is to improve the signal to interference and noise ratio. We, and the key factor is what we saw is reduce the cell overlap with multiple different ways. Another key factor is to control the noise, control PEM. It's crucial for LTE. By adding more, we can add more capacity by adding small cells or by splitting beams. That gives us a lot of options to add more capacity to the network. We need to keep optimizing the network. Traffic patterns change. Uh, we have more, we have companies switching to another vendor, and then we have like several hundred more users in a specific area. We need to keep optimizing networks. 
to maintain the good quality. And also implement new technology features that I talked about that are going to come and that are going to help us tremendously. What I talked about today, all of these features are available today. You can do that today with the tools you have before all these other great features come and help you in the future. Thank you. All right, thanks for that presentation. Um, so we have, a, it looks like we have a couple time, uh, time for a couple questions here. So um, first one, um, how does the small cell market vary compared to the macro cell? We see that the small cell market is growing. <clears throat> uh, it, the majority of deployments are still macro cell antennas, but we see the small cells are growing, uh, some areas faster than others. Uh, it, it depends on, on uh, every operator has a different view on, on small cells, uh, and the small cell market is growing right now. We see some, some good results of it, and we, I've seen some operators which actually in some regions have 50% of the RF planners working on small cells and 50% work on macro cells. That is some, some areas I see. So it's growing. It's not there yet. That's not by far not on the same level as macro cell, but it's growing. And the simplicity to deploy them uh, suggests that it's growing faster. Very great. Next question we had come in is uh, with twin beam or even tri beam antennas, um, does this make the assumption that the number of radios will double? and triple respectively? Yes. Yeah, essentially these antennas allow you to, uh, to deploy more radios on the same side without increasing the antenna, si uh, antenna count. Without adding a new antenna, you can deploy more radios on the same side. That, that enables you to generate more, more uh, revenue from the same side. So it's a good return of investment uh, calculation there. Great. Uh, I think we have time for two more questions. So uh, next one, is Comscope DAS equipment moving towards SIPRI interfaces? I, I cannot talk about DAS equipment. Uh, there's some other experts on that. I can come back to you with that, but I'm not an expert on the or DAS equipment. I'm on the outdoor side. Okay, great. Um, we have another question about small cells. So is there any concrete guideline to classify a small cell, such as size, coverage area, or capacity limit? There, um, there, there is a limitation, or a limitation, a definition that for a, an antenna, if the volume of the antenna is less than three cubic feet, then that is considered a small cell. Um, this is one definition that allows a lot of historic sites, etc. The the approval authorities there for historic sites that they accept that. Of course, every city has their own limitations on top of that, but one limitation, one definition is three cubic feet. So in my view, um, in my view, you see actually the, the the sharp border between this is a small cell and this is a macro cell merging somehow together. So the antennas which are small cell, they are less than three cubic feet. There's a small cell quasi omni, but they're three and a half foot long. It's like almost a mini macro. So I think what we're seeing is we're seeing like a merging of small cell and 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 macro cell together that because you see small cells being deployed as a mini macro and they're, they're getting longer and longer. So it's not really a sharp definition in my view. This is a small cell, this is a macro cell. It's, it's merging more and more together. All right, great. I think that's about all the time we have today. I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, Capacity and Throughput Enhancements in LTE Networks, presented by Comscope. Again, our presenter today was Holger Rader, Product Line Manager, Base Station Antenna Systems at Comscope. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.